everyone, and thank you for joining our first Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinar of 2016. I'm Lauren Young of Freshly Baked Communications, and today I'll be moderating a webinar that's part of our series of interactive experiences with trusted industry experts on the topic of building collaborative partnerships. So our experts today are the perfect example of collaboration at its best, and you may know one of them as a current Ascendus expert. They have actually joined forces to start their own consulting firm this year, and they are debuting their brand new venture with us today, so it's very exciting. Our topic is Put the Power of Collaborative Relationships to Work, and Nicole DeFalco and Denny McGrewer of Partners. They are partners of Upsurge Advisors. They will be leading our discussion this morning. So welcome, Nicole and Denny. Hey, Lauren. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Excited to be here. Awesome. So if you're new to our Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinars, I'll give you a little bit of detail about us. Uh, you're aware, you may be aware that these are brought to you by the Chicago-based firm Ascendus Learning Connection that was founded by Sue Drake. She's a learning management expert here in Chicago and beyond. So our goal is to provide you with timely information and presentations that can be expanded into customized learning modules for your organization. And in turn, we hope that you can use this information to build supplemental partnerships for your organization and generate new growth and progress. So one of the things that I actually give you three things that the Masterminds for Managers webinar series allows you to do is that you have the opportunity to, one, meet one of our subject matter experts, or two of them in the case of today, who can potentially help you solve a business challenge that's currently facing your organization. Two, you can experience firsthand a possible solution for your organization. So you have this opportunity to test the waters before recommending the option internally. Then three, you can see the experts in action to ensure that they are a good fit for your organization in terms of style, personality, and approach. So just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Please keep your phones on mute to eliminate any background noise during the conference. You will have an opportunity to ask questions with our experts at the end of the webinar. In the meantime, if you have any burning questions or you'd like to submit additional comments to Nicole, Denny, or I during the presentation, you are welcome to participate by using the chat feature, which you can find at the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So once again, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar where Nicole and Denny will be happy to answer as many questions as they can during the allotted time. All right. So if that sounds good, here's what's playing in today's webinar. Nicole and Denny will start off with their challenge of the day for everyone. And then we'll get into our test the water segment, which is a chance for you to test drive bringing these experts into your organization. And we'll finally wrap up with our What's the Buzz segment, where we'll ask you to give us your feedback. What did you learn from the experts today? Okay. And if you're new to our webinars, or if you have never played our game before, we have a special game that we play called Term of the Day. During each webinar this year, we unveil a brand new term, Wheel of Fortune style, as you can see here. The first person to submit the correct answer in the chat field will win two entries in our end of the year drawing for a complimentary training that is facilitated by any of the Ascendus experts that you will see this year during the webinars. Don't worry if you can't guess the term yet. We will flash the slide again throughout the webinar with more letters filled in. So best of luck to you. Also, if you're driving on the way to the airport, you can only listen in today. That's fine. You can still participate on Twitter by using the um, handle Drake Ascendus. And the hashtag is AscendusMM. So for those of you that are listening only once again and you can't view the live webinar, this is a great way for you to stay included in the conversation. Okay. So before we get going, I'll give you a few more details on your host this morning. I serve as the CEO and founder of Freshly Baked Communications, which is a brand strategy and content writing firm that specializes in creating memorable brand messaging for businesses but need a fresh take on their marketing. I enjoy baking, of course, photography, and I teach groups how to make marketing fun through interactive games and competitions. So in lieu of reading Nicole and Denny's very lengthy and very accomplished bios, I'd like the audience to get to know you both personally, if that's okay. 
That would be great. So, okay, perfect. So I'm aware that you both have worked together for a very long time, but I'd like to ask Denny, how did you two first meet? Well, N- Nicole and I met a few years ago when I was running a corporate training organization in uh, in Chicago, and Nicole was a brand new instructional designer in the organization. And at one point in early in her career, uh, she asked if uh, uh, what her goals were. I asked her, and she said with a straight face, very simply, "I want your job." And <laughs> thought for a moment, and while that didn't happen over the years. Uh, some very positive things did happen in the ensuing years where we developed an extremely mutual appreciation of each other's uh, skills, and we displayed a passion and commitment to assist others in their individual or team personal development journey as they went forward. Uh, we really, over the last nine years, then consolidated a lot of that effort and that commitment, and which has led to the launch of our new company, Upsurge Advisors and a growth model, which we're excited to share with you today as we go forward the next hour or so. By the way, Denny's response was, I'm not even sure I want this job yet. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, one more question before we begin. On your website, your brand new beautiful website, there are a number of images that I saw that feature peaches. What's all of this about? Well, you're not the only one that's asked me that. Every time I pass out a business card in the last five weeks, I've had the same question. So a little clarification. Uh, I moved here uh, six years ago from Chicago, enjoyed the wonderful variety of peaches that the South Carolina has to offer, uh, 29 and counting more. While Georgia receives a lot of attention as the peach state, South Carolina, believe it or not, is second only to California in quantity, and we consider it first in quality. And I've always had a a personal appreciation of of the agricultural footprint wherever I've lived. I've moved 14 times in my business career around the country and overseas. And I just have a lot of respect for the commitment that I've observed and and been part of down here in South Carolina, the peach industry, as they take on their growing process year in and year out. And I thought it seemed very appropriate in alignment to our growth model as that we're bringing to the marketplace. So the visual references you see throughout our documents and our business card and our website really is focused on growth, and we're looking forward to helping individuals and teams grow in the future. Wow, very well said. You are a professional, sir. All right. (laughs) So as Nicole and Denny begin, I would like to let you know that they do have a special giveaway for you at the end of this presentation. So be sure to pay close attention to the information they are about to share. And we will start with today's challenge of the day. Okay, great. Thanks, Lauren. Well, usually when we do the challenge of the day, we kind of put up a whole bunch of stats and um, of kind of what's happening out in the business world. This time we thought we'd do something different and really focus on the participants who are joining us. So in the registration process, we had asked you, Uh, If you could think of a time where the strength of your relationship with a stakeholder was the reason a problem was solved, and interestingly, 86% of you said yes. So that's the good news, right, is that you can think of a time where, and hopefully more than one, right, where you've had these really strong partnerships or collaborative relationships already. Um, The next question that we had asked you was, Um, what benefits you would want to gain by improving your stakeholder relationships. And we got some interesting results. Um, Some of the things that came up were trust, better understanding, um, client loyalty, and ability for deeper influence, right? Denny, what did you see when you looked at these words? One of the things that was really interesting, I thank everybody on the call that participated, gave input, because it would have taken me months to get this kind of feedback uh, on a personal basis, one-on-one. But some of the words that just jump out at you, you know, they were more than just once or twice. It was relationships, influence, understanding, trust. And those are all focused on what we're here to talk about is how do we bi- really build your business results and have some personal growth for you and at the same time have a lot of job satisfaction. I do a lot of executive coaching over the last 10 years, and one of the critical things for a successful leader is job satisfaction. But I also have to be very candid and somewhat crass in 
this takes work. This just doesn't happen. You don't develop influencing skills or work on relationships, have relationships or build trust without a tremendous commitment and personal passion. But it also takes time. And every one of you on this call are, have limited time to do lots of different things. So that's what I, we're excited about is we've worked at this for many years and what we've been excited about putting together is a plan or a growth model that you can take part of it, pieces of it, or the entire uh, effort and implement that personally and throughout your organization and start develop or enhance relationships, influencing skills, et cetera. So thanks for the guidance and input. Yeah, it was great. So what we'd like you to do is we go through, um, and we're going to do what we call a test the water segment in a moment, where we're going to show you our growth model and kind of how we bring it to the table with our clients um, and you know, the, the possibilities there. But as we go through it, think about all you can accomplish if you had a way to consistently create these collaborative relationships. So that's really what this is all about is, you know, the good news is we can think of times where we've had these strong partnerships, we know the benefits that we want to get. The, the idea is to make it a predictable, repeatable process for yourself and for your business. Uh, before we jump into uh, test the waters, though, let's give them a shot again, Lauren. Anybody want to take a chance at uh, guessing our term of the day? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we filled in a couple of additional letters here. You can start guessing whenever you're ready or just mark them down on a piece of paper in front of you and think about it as we go through the rest of the presentation. Just remember the first person to guess the correct term of the day We'll win two entries in our end of the year drawing for a complimentary training that will be facilitated by your Ascendus expert of choice that has delivered a webinar this year. Okay, no, no takers so far. All right. We'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and you can enter the term anytime. Lauren's monitoring the chat, so. Yes. Okay, and we are ready now to test the waters. And again, this is where we're going to give you a taste of, of the program um, and the way that we approach um, building collaborative relationships with stakeholders. What you see here is our model uh, for cultivating business relationships and the segments that make it up. These are tools and methods we're about to introduce uh, that we call the growth model. And it's based on our personal experiences, successes we've had, and quite frankly, the failures we've learned from, plus best practices from a variety of industries and a great deal of research. And in fact, from some of the people on this call that are participating have been colleagues of ours who have assisted us in our growth in developing this model. The model itself represents the most effective and efficient way to build a collaborative, trusting-based relationship with internal clients who we've worked with, customers, coworkers, managers, or suppliers to mutually uh, accomplish beneficial objectives. The first step is the G, which stands for Groundwork for Commitment. And that's a word a lot of people like to use, but most of you, I'm sure, I know probably over half the people that are on this call, uh, understand the rigor and discipline it takes to make a commitment and exhibit it in a marketplace. Yep. And so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to tell you the story about um, three people. This is Mikhail, Andrea, and Javier. Uh, we're also known as the team. And actually they are, uh, this is a story that we've put together. It's actually a combination of um, two of our real client situations that we've dealt with. And so what I'm going to do is tell you where the team is right now. And what I'd like you to do is in the chat, put what you think is kind of going wrong here, okay? So here's where we are with the team. Uh, what you see here are amazing recruiters. They work in a mid-sized corporation and have a really strong track record for success for sourcing talent, um, both for short-term staffing needs as well as permanent placement. However, many departments in their company actually pay outside recruiting and staffing firms instead of coming to the team, and this ends up costing the company a lot of money. The team thought, you know what, if they could just get people to understand what they bring to the table, they would start using them more. So they developed a detailed presentation and they kind of took it on the road. Sadly, very few people showed up to their lunch and learns and the problem persisted. So the team started to wonder, how can we meet our objectives when we can't get the involvement we need from others? So let's hear from you in the chat. What went wrong? What do you think? 
kind of told you where the team is right now, if you had to make an assessment. Marty says their customers don't see them as a partner. Yeah, definitely. What else? What do other people think? What did they do wrong? So they're not, you know, they're not viewed as a partner, right? Well, that's why they're, you know, they're going outside for sure. Um, and this happens, you know, again, this is kind of a culmination of uh, a couple of client situations that we've worked on. Um, and we've seen that a lot where, you know, someone will have internal capabilities, yet the company ends up putting a lot of money out for third-party help because they don't really even know what their internal teams have to offer. Anybody else have any other thoughts? And, Nicole, do you thoughts? think this happens more with decentralized corporations versus ones that basically send all um, changes and modifications up the chain of command? You know, yeah, probably. I mean, I think when you sort of have that um, federated model, um, you have kind of strategy driven from, you know, a central place and then, you know, actual local execution. So I think sometimes there's a weakening of the message when you get out into that, you know, in that federated model. So I think that does happen. Although we've mm -hmm. seen, you know, we worked with one, one IT group that was very tight and very close in with their, um, their internal customers and they were still not, you know, really leveraged very well. A um, few people said, we had, Kevin mentioned, they haven't branded themselves yet. Uh, Lori says, a lack of communication on past successes or failures, right? And that's kind of what you were speaking to, Lauren, was that idea that the, you know, the message is kind of weak. So these mm -hmm. are all really great, um, you know, really great ideas. You know, one thing that we hear a lot is that if they only understood us, right, that perspective, if we could only get them to know us and, and understand us. So to keep that in mind because that's, that's a mantra we hear a lot, and that's kind of part of the problem. But let's look at what the team did. So following the growth model, as we said, the first step is that groundwork for commitment. Um, and so what we, what we look at in this step is we take from Stephen Covey's second habit of highly effective people, and we start with the end in mind. For those of you who are on the phone, what I have on screen is just a definition that we use of what we mean by a collaborative, a collaborative partnership. So a trust-based relationship between us and our stakeholders focused on the achievement of mutual goals. So that was kind of the vision that they had. When we talk about a stakeholder, that can be anybody, an internal or an external client, uh, shareholders, vendors, suppliers, end users. Um, it's pretty much anybody you need to work with and through to meet your objectives. So for the team, they were thinking about when they, when they sort of answered the same question you answered, right, where has there been a strong relationship in the past, they thought about the IT department. The IT department used the team for all their short and long-term recruiting. Um, the team knew the IT strategy and culture, and they provided them with retention and engagement stats that were often called in, um, and they were often called in um, to provide kind of a people perspective during planning cycles. So what the team wanted was to have all of their relationships like that. And the good news is when you think about your successes as the team did, it gives you the courage and confidence to commit to doing what it takes to build these trust-based partnerships with all stakeholders. Well, following on into the next step of our growth model, uh, we've got R, which really stands for committed to pursuing their end goal, like Nicole was referencing a moment ago with the IT department. And the team took the next step, which is recognize and adapt. And we're going to have a little poll here relevant to uh, what we're discussing. Take a moment to finish this sentence according to Peter Drucker. Culture is takes a backseat to strategy, B, eat strategy for breakfast, C, tastes like chicken, and D is for human resources to worry about. Thanks, Jenny. So everybody can vote right on your screen right now. I see a couple of people are putting their answers in the chat. You can actually vote right on the screen. I'll give you about five seconds. Three. You just hit one of the radio buttons and then click submit. Ah, oh, somebody, ha, 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 tastes like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know All if right. we have the representative from Chick-fil-A on the phone. But I'm right. That was right. We, <laughs> we had asked Chick-fil-A to come along. <laughs> Very good. Okay. We're going to go ahead and look at the results now. Okay. Nicole and Denny, what do you see on your end? Well, the good news is that 60, almost 64% of people have heard the Peter Drucker quote, so culture takes a backseat to strategy. Correct. <laughs> right. Well, let's talk about the culture that we deal with or the cultures you deal with. Every organization has a dominant culture. 
and every department within an organization has a variation of all of its own. Organization cultures uh, are made up of a group of stories, norms, communication preferences, leadership styles, processes, and certainly social networks. An organization's culture affects the health, I think, uh, and collaborative partnerships that need to evolve in, in all of your organizations. It really determines the relationship management styles, tools, and methods that will work best. This means that we have to recognize what are the aspects of the cultures, and we've observed those over the last nine to ten years we've been working together, that are helping or hindering the relationship and adapt it accordingly. And I do a lot of work in this area with executive coaching initiatives. Now on to the next element of the growth process. It's probably the most important and the one that I'm most passionate about after being in the corporate world for over 35 years is the absolutely opt-in and trust section of our model. Yeah, so let's take a poll on this for a moment. So what I'd like you to do is on a scale of 1 to 10, okay, so with let's say 10 is all our allies until proven enemies and 1 being all our enemies until proven allies, how much do you trust someone you just met? Okay, so again, 10 is you assume everyone's an ally until they prove otherwise, 1 being, you know what, uh, all our enemies until they prove otherwise. How much do you trust someone you just met? And go ahead and vote. Um, right on the uh, right on screen. And by the way, Lauren, if you um, take a look in the poll, Lori, Lori's our winner. Oh, fantastic! Very good. So yes, we do have a winner for the mystery term, and we will unveil it when we get to the next slide. Um, but Lori Parker is our winner. Congratulations, Lori. Okay. Right, so I'm sorry call. for that distraction. Congrats, Lori. But go ahead and vote. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and look at the results now. How are we doing? Okay. So we had 29% um, said uh, 0 to 3. We had about 57% at 4 to 6, and about 14% 7 to 10. So interestingly, your response to this question is a strong predictor of how trusted you are. And that's because the more we trust, the more we are trusted. The easier it is to give trust, the easier it is to earn it. Because without trust, it's nearly impossible to get work done with and through others. One of the things I'd add to what Nicole just said is recently I had had a three-year uh, engagement in New York City around Wall Street. That in itself is a challenge. But uh, if you look at this these makeup of the, the uh, summary or the survey or the question, and you take 10 different people in an organization, right there it shows you 30% are at one level, another 30%. So you really have a mixed bag, and it's so important that you develop a transparent environment that's really sharing to build trust, or collaboration will not work and your goals will not get accomplished. The, uh, the, the, ne the next area relevant to trust is really this is Stephen Covey still gets quoted many times because of the believability and how much it really is real in the marketplace. But giving and earning trust is really critical and it's absolutely almost ludicrous to think that you're going to build collaborative relationships with stakeholders without a nearly frantic or just de totally dedicated focus on trust. And the most successful organizations have a high, high level of trust uh, as for healthy relationships in both business and it helps in your personal life. Yeah. The, by the way, for those who are on the phone and, and can't see on screen, the Stephen Covey quote we have is, trust is the glue of life. It's the most essential ingredient in effective communication. It's the foundational principle that holds all relationships. Well, going to, to the screen again, it, what we've shown here is, is a chart that uh, we've used over the years in, in trust workshops that we've conducted uh, throughout the country and overseas. But this was, is being really provided by the U.S. Coast Guard, and it's drawn from their leadership development program that I'm very close to because a family member in the Coast Guard. And it's a set, subset of behaviors that build and destroy trust. And it's interesting. You can take this chart in your organization and take out the, 
the, the comments under what build, what behaviors build trust and what destroy, destroy trust and ask, divide the group up in six and six and the outcome is very powerful and then you start working on how do you integrate these two behaviors and make so that people really develop a trusting environment and a commitment to it. And it really gives people an ability to get things done, a benevolence to do actions that we really care about and support them, and most importantly, people keep their word in this very, very active business world we're in. Yep. So let's kind of recap for a moment. So we lay the groundwork for commitment. That's our G, our first step. We recognize, you know what, we can do this. We've had success before. We can have success again. It's just a matter of, you know, being willing to do what it's going to take. The next step is we need to recognize and adapt to the culture in which we're building our stakeholder relationships and then seeing how vital it is. We're really going to focus on opt-in and trust, those behaviors that build trust. And when we go through this in detail in, in the program that we have, one of the things that we look at is not only what the behaviors are that build and destroy trust, but what's behind that, why? So that you're very aware, you know, that way you can really adjust your own behavior on a consistent basis if you understand what's at the root of, of trust. The next thing we need to do is widen our reach. We need to become more influential. Powerful, consistent relationship cultivators work hard to grow their influence. They want to have what it takes to lead others in the pursuit of corporate priorities and the greater good. So here's another poll question for you. True or false, the ability to influence is innate. Either you have it or you don't. True or false? Go ahead and see a vote here. should be getting used to this now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give you five more seconds to vote here. Three, two, one. Let's look at the results. Oh, there we go. We have one that came in like right at the last minute. So we are at a 75-25 split. 75% false. So congratulations, those of you who said false. You're right. Um, when we talk about influence, we're talking about understanding what needs to get done and then motivating others to cooperate and join in. So the good news is influence is not always something you're born with. I mean, granted, certain characteristics like charisma are helpful, which, you know, that's great if you're George Clooney, but there are other sources of influence that anyone can tap into. Um, those include advantages provided by a situation and then also a match between skills in a situation, so being, you know, the right person for the job. Um, Denny, you want to tell that story about the marketing group we worked with? Oh, as far as the marketing group was uh, really uh, had a tremendous challenge with getting people to attend meetings. And they would just not even show up for meetings. When they would ask people, why don't you come, they just didn't, wouldn't even answer and reply. And so we really explored the situation. They realized there was a huge rift between two departments. Neither one would attend, as I said. And so then the marketing team decided to become moderators to repair the relationship between the two groups. And they worked diligently on it, earning trust and enhancing the level of influence. And we put a lot of tools together. And literally in a matter of six to nine months, meeting attendance went away and it was not a problem anymore. And you could have you walked into the office and you would see smiles on their face. As I said to the group towards the end of the whole session, when a leader in the company looks at you're going to have a meeting on Sunday night before the week gets started, you want to make sure that individual says, I want to be there because things happen. I trust the people that are going to be presenting because they've done their homework in advance. And uh, it really was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, experience and growth for everybody involved. And yeah. The department's got huge recognition from the executive team. Yeah, and some of those folks went on to very senior leadership roles. But that was it was an amazing situation. I mean, that was the Hatfields and the McCoys. We'd never seen anything like that, so pretty incredible. So that actually kind of brings us to our next step, which is Thrive and Triumph. And in Thrive and Triumph, we're really looking at the winning activities that people pursue daily. Um, you know, really to uh, to grow your influence and cultivate relationships. So we'll kind of go back to the team and. We'll use them as our example. They decided it was worth the effort to enhance their influence. So they started networking more, making connections between groups, filling structural holes. And that story Denny told is an example of filling a structural hole, you know, bridging communication between groups, 
uh, they started to really work on strengthening their critical thinking skills. Uh, that becomes very important if you want to you know, be effective with your collaboration and make that a productive process. We work with them on um, you know, communication, listening, and questioning are very important, being able to ask good questions that get people talking, and then listening to the answer and, and spending more time listening than you know, telling, more asking than telling, really. So they invested in their interpersonal skills so they could build consensus and communicate better with their stakeholders. Okay, let, let's take a reality check for a moment. And we're at the end of our actually G-R-O-W-T and what we'd like to talk about is the attitudes, the skills, the habits, the behaviors. And now this is something that we really don't always have at our disposal. While this transformation is taking place, there are pressing situations that you really need to address immediately. People have objectives to achieve in a tight time frame, a frame, frame as I referenced earlier, and they need a strategy to apply to get results today, not tomorrow or down the road. Okay, so that brings us to H, um, which is harvest results now. But we're going to take a break from the team for a moment. We're going to step away, and we'd like to introduce you to uh, two sisters. This is Yvonne and Nancy. And they have a do-it-yourself project that they're working on. They're going to renovate this room to be an office. They are so excited, they jump right in. Yvonne starts knocking out one wall on one side of the room. Nancy begins painting another wall. And now here are Yvonne and Nancy six hours later, <laughs> and the room is a mess. They've made no progress. So in the chat, what we'd like to have you do is tell us what one thing would have made this go much smoother. Okay, um, what's kind of the one thing they could have done differently that would have saved them a lot of time and wasted effort? So let's see what some of your thoughts are in the chat. What do you think? A plan, All right. right? Exactly. So we've got, oh, everybody, <laughs> like a flood of people in the chat just hitting that word. Uh, Donna says, sharing their vision for the project with each other before starting. Talk to each other about priorities, Elizabeth says, and then we have a bunch of people saying plan. Absolutely. If they had spent a few minutes up front planning out a process and determining how best to work together, they could have saved a lot of time and effort. And so that's what, um, what H is, is harvest results now. This is the process um, that we bring to the table. And like renovating Yvonne and Nancy's new office, the key ingredients for cultivating successful partnerships are patience and careful planning. So the Harvest Results Now process shown here is the culmination of years of personal experience and best practices that we've gleaned from high performers from a variety of industries and functional areas. And behind each one of these steps, we've got uh, different themes and attitudes for people to take on, but also just some really practical tools so they can apply this right away. We, we use this process in our own uh, corporate and consulting and coaching ro roles in, over the last uh, few years. And we've seen uh, project managers, marketing managers, shared service teams, and uh, HR leaders use these methods to uh, win support for their initiatives, but also to evaluate their status and credibility with stakeholders. And that's really important to reach out to the stakeholders and find out how are we doing and don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them and earn their trust and get significant results as a result of that. Yeah. So when we had... Um in the registration when we had asked you those questions, one of the other questions that we asked you, the third one was, when it comes to interactions with your stakeholders, are you more proactive or reactive? And we had 90% proactive and 10% reactive. So the good news is when you have a plan for advancing stakeholder relationships, every interaction, whether reactive or proactive, becomes an opportunity to build trust and strengthen the relationships. By following a structured approach, professionals like the team are able to tackle today's opportunities while strengthen, strengthening the capabilities they need to create and sustain collaborative partnerships in the long run. And um, speaking about the team, let's, uh, let's go back to them here and see how they're doing, right? So um, what we have here for those who are on the phone is we have a picture of the team and we've got a saying underneath them, seek first to understand before trying to be understood. So the team realized you know, that their results were directly impacted by their stakeholder relationships. And that's when they made that commitment to change. But instead of trying to be understood, what they did was they changed their mindset to this idea of seeking first to understand. 
And once they made the mindset change, then their actions naturally transformed to align with that critical perspective. So now the good news is they're able to readily inspire trust and build collaborative partnerships with their stakeholders. Today, most departments work with the team for their recruiting needs and they treat them as trusted advisors. Other groups reach out to them for strategic insight. And the best part is they're invited to celebrate successes when engagement and retention targets are met. Well, the slide that's now up, for those of you that can't see it, is just a summary slide about our growth model for cultivating business relationships that matter. But in a moment, what we want to do in a collaborative mode is to ask you, what, are, what have you learned? What surprised you most about the information we've been sharing with you? And give you a chance to ask us questions. But first, we have another chance at the term of the day. Actually, we don't even need to do that. We're going to bypass that because that's right. Lori won it. We were all set for for people not getting it. So congrats to Lori. <laughs> so here we go. Well, Lori, yeah. we'll, hand it, we'll hand it back over to you, Lauren. All right. Thank you both so much. Great job, Nicole and Denny. So, yes, our term of the day was guessed by Lori Parker. The term was human factor, which I'm sure you heard Nicole and Denny mention a couple of times throughout the presentation. So, Congrats, Lori. Um, you're winning two entries in our end of the year drawing for a complimentary training facilitated by any attendance expert of your choice that delivers a webinar. It could be Nicole and Denny, but hopefully you come back and that everyone else on the webinar today comes back to see some of our other featured um, experts. So this is, as Denny said, the time where we'd like to hear a little bit more from you. What did you come away with in today's webinar? Was there an example? Was there a quote, a statement? or something that just made you pause and think about your own organization? If so, we invite you to share some last minute thoughts and questions with us by using the chat feature. Um, let's see, one last time. So I see we have a couple coming in. I'm going to give everybody a chance to start typing those and let you know about today's special offer. So I'll turn it back over to Nicole really quickly. Yeah, so we want to thank you for your participation in the webinar. And so what we'd like to offer everyone who is on, um, you know, on this webinar, a 15% discount on a one-day version of Cultivating Business Relationships that we can tailor for your organization. And the way that this is going to work is Sue Drake is going to follow up and contact you. Uh, she's going to contact everybody. So do take her call or set time to meet with her um, and to discuss scheduling the workshop for your organization. And at the um, and same time, the 15% yeah. break, uh, if we do run a workshop for you at, at the break time, I'll bring a dozen peaches from South Carolina. <laughs> They're very good, by the way. Take them up on that offer. <laughs> for <laughs> sure. Um, and also, if you're interested in learning more about today's program, you can find out this information on our website, which is drakeresources.com. I'm sorry, drake-resources.com backslash ascendus-learning-connection. So you can see some of our past webinars there, our full expert listing, fantastic blog articles, and so much more. Just make sure to search for today's course title, which was Put the Power of Collaborative Relationships to Work, or you can just visit the Ascendus Advisors Expert page. If you did register for this webinar in advance, we will send out an email in the next day or so that will contain a link to this recording so you can listen to it again. All right. And just a quick little preview for you here. Here's the Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinar schedule for the year. So as you see, our next webinar is scheduled for March 9th, 2016. So you will get an email about this in the next couple of weeks. And you can join our Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinar group on LinkedIn if you want to get more information about the webinars and also network and talk to Nicole and Denny as well. All right. So we have a bunch of questions that are coming Yeah, we in had here. a lot firing off in the chat. So. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's start with Lori. Lori says she found it interesting that the level of trust that your team has is determined by your level of trust. What do you think of that? You know, it's interesting because we, um, it, it's different. It's a little counterintuitive, but that's really how it goes is, um, you know, most of us think, that it's, you know, we can earn, you know, trust, we're earning, we're earning, we're earning it, but a lot of times it's what you're granting that makes a difference. And we worked with, um, we worked with one individual who was really struggling a lot um, around that. You know, when we asked him, you know, where he fell on that one to 10 scale, he was a solid, I think he was below, wasn't he about a negative one on right. how much trust? 
and he and he was sort of complaining about how hard it was for him to get you know again people to come to cross functional meetings and working with him and he really had to kind of step back and and take an assessment of you know that his he was so closed off and afraid to trust that it was you know he was sending out a vibe that was you know making people not trust him so it is an interesting um interesting perspective mm-hmm. Gloria, additionally uh i i think People have to look at their behaviors. And one of the things I said earlier a few moments ago, when you start looking at behaviors on both sides, ones that destroy trust and ones that build trust, it, it, it jumps out at you and people go, aha, I, I can run a one-hour workshop on building and destroying trust behaviors, and then two days later you walk down the hall of an office or an operation and they say, can we have a, day, a one-day workshop off-site to work on this? It's, it's truly uh, impactful if you yeah. get people to really open up and talk about it and, and do a self-analysis. It's, it, it works. For sure. Looks like Donna has a question here. With culture being so critical, what number one element do you feel most organizations are lacking when it comes to culture? Hmm. Danny, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm, I have my thought on that. What's yours on <laughs> where you think when it comes to culture is a, kind of the biggest? Well, I think it's sharing. It, yeah. It's sharing. It's also sharing your 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 concerns and, and being open. Uh, the, the cultures that we've just admired and worked with, you can walk in from the receptionist all the way to the CEO. It's a sharing environment, and uh, you have to put put aside your own prejudices or your own feelings and, and listen to other people and and observe what they're saying and work together. But it truly is, I think, if, you know, if it was an elevator speech, I'd start all with sharing. Yeah. I And I, I agree. I was actually kind of thinking, too, that the culture can either make or break in a lot of ways where it, you know, there might be a lot of, um, like I've seen this a lot, I do a lot with onboarding, and you see a lot of talk about our people and how important our people are and our people are first. and. And yet there's actually reality when you work in the organization, a kind of a sense of fear and, and not really feeling, you know, truly, you know, the, the processes and the systems don't actually marry up with the espoused value of people. So, and I think that goes to that sharing too, where um, there really does truly have to be that openness. And again, it goes back to trust, right? If there's trust in the culture um, and people are, are, are really truly caring for each other, then, you know, I think the organization does much better. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, Jeff has a question. He has some friends that were not available today. Um, so once again, if you did have people that you would like to forward this to, you will receive an email in a couple of days, and you can forward that along to them with the link to this recording if they'd like to check it out. And also join the LinkedIn group. There's a lot of great information being shared there about this topic and many other topics that our experts have discussed. Yeah. I see we mm-hmm. have another question from Jeff. Do we have a, do we have a minute to tackle that one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's see. Do you all help organizations create, develop, or refine a set of values? From my world, values are at the very foundation for an or- how an organization expects people to behave and perhaps the most important element of culture. Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. Thank you. Um, yeah, what we do when we do strategic planning with groups, um, values become a huge part of that. So we look at you know, what is the vision or the, the most compelling aspiration for the group? We use a process called SOAR. Um, so it's Strengths, Opportunities, Aspirations, and Results. It's from Appreciative Inquiry. So we kind of cast that, that aspirational view of where are we going. And then when we start to look at putting the strategy together, the initiatives and the goals, a large part of that is the values that the group um, embraces. And though we really look at what are the behaviors for success. So given what we want, to, we want to achieve, how do we have to work with each other and with our stakeholders uh, to get that done? Because it's not only about what you do, it's how you do it. Um, so we look at both sides of that equation. The uh, additional comment is that I think values is at the cornerstone of outstanding executive uh, demonstration or uh, leadership. And I've had the opportunity to work with a number of leaders over the last 10 years, and I, critical to, to their success or their demise is where are their values. And what happens is maybe their values aren't consistent with the environment. Uh, I would encourage anybody on this phone call, if, 
you have a set of values, make sure you take a look at the set of values in the arena that you work today. If there's a disconnect, try to address it or take other appropriate action because it won't work. You'll be a very unhappy or teams will be unhappy and they will not be productive. So there's no question values is critical. And it starts with leadership and people opening up and being transparent and taking a look at it. In any executive coaching initiative I've done in the last 10 years, over 96 of them has involved analysis of that individual's values. And what happens with that, then all of a sudden they open up and say, let's talk to the rest of the team about their values and build on where, the, where there's a misconnect and connect them together. And again, that comes back to our continued reference to trust, and it just becomes enormous leverage within the organization. Wonderful. Thanks, Jenny and Nicole. Sure. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your participation in the question and answer session. Um, Nicole and Denny are fantastic business people as well as really, really great people just to know personally. So please reach out. There is information on the slide here if you'd like to get in contact with them or engage them for a potential engagement for your company. So please um, write this down or keep it handy for the future. If I don't see any additional questions either in the chat field or on Twitter, I'm going to wrap January's edition of the Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinar. Nicole, Denny, and I would like to say thank you very much on behalf of the entire Ascendus team for your participation. And we hope you learned something new that you can share with your team and you can start putting those collaborative relationships to work in 2016 as well. Take care, and I look forward to seeing you back here again in March.